This is the Extra Point, an Arizona's Family Originals podcast, sponsored by your Phoenix Suns. Well, a bombshell in the golf world today and a Sun Devil legend right in the middle of it. John Rahm is joining the Live Tour, announced this afternoon. And Rahm uh, has been making some media rounds explaining his decision. Let's talk to a man who actually got to be part of a news conference with him as, as John Rahm went through why he's leaving the PGA Tour and joining Live Golf. Let's go out to the East Coast and check in with our man Adam Woodard, a good friend of the Extra Point here on Arizona's Family. Thanks for making time for us tonight. And uh, what was your reaction to hearing the news today, something that had been rumored for a while, but to actually see it happening, John Rahm is with Live Golf. Yeah, it's one of those things where there's there's so much smoke, there's got to be a little fire there at some point, right? And we've been hearing about this for, for the last couple of weeks, and it's really picked up, especially over the last two weeks. So it really wasn't as groundbreaking as I thought. It was more of just things kind of being confirmed, right? Because we had all heard the rumors for so long, and it wasn't a matter of when it, if it was going to happen, but rather when it was going to happen. So definitely shocked to, to, to see that the world number three is going, especially given everything he has said in the past about the PGA Tour and his support for it, about Liv and his questions with the format i mean he straight up came out and said that you know shotgun starts 54 holes that's not a real competition tonight talking to a few reporters on a zoom call he said look you know opinions change i've been able to i've changed my opinion people evolve i have um vaguely hinted that there might be some changes coming to lives format saying that you know he hopes lives he heeds some of his advice so do they make a change to 72 holes maybe do they change some of their some of their product, maybe, but he was very, you know, complimentary of the product and said, you know, the, the big word was evolve. He said that multiple times. You know, he's seen the evolution of Live over the last two years. He's seen how it's become a global product, and it's something he wanted to be a part of. And legacy was also a big thing that he talked about. And I guess he sees this as his way to, to really make his legacy. How much of this do you think is about the money? And how much of this do you think is about the way the proposed merger was handled with Rom not finding out until right before? Yeah, I definitely. Th I mean, he was he's been outspoken in the past saying that, you know, he didn't like the backroom dealings and the fact that it kind of happened overnight and they didn't no one knew about it until, you know, they went on the you know, was it MSNBC, you know, broadcast, you know, Yasser and Jay talking about it. He was definitely not happy about that. But I don't think the money had as much to play with it um, as some might think. Sure, we've seen the, the reports of a six hundred million dollar deal. He obviously didn't talk about any of his contract specifics with us. But he did say that, you know, he's been in the past saying money's not going to change anything. Money's not going to change anything. But it, 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 he did say, look, they put that offer in front of me. Right. And I had to I had to consider it. So I de money was definitely part of it. He's not going to he's not going to lie to us and say that it wasn't. But I definitely think it was more the fact that maybe he wasn't as appreciated as he thought as a Rory McIlroy, as a Tiger Woods was. And he thinks he should be. And obviously, I think he should be as well. He's the two-time major champion at 29 years old. He's won a bunch of huge events, both on the PGA Tour and the DP World Tour reigning masters champion i mean that's as high class as you get and when he's at his best i think he's the best player in the world you put him and scotty victor hovland you know rory all of these guys at their best i think john rom comes out on top of those guys if, if they're all playing their best game and i definitely think that had more to do with it than the money but i obviously both of those were were a part of the decision but he was also very clear in saying that this had nothing to do with the framework agreement and i think we can we can take him at his word for that seeing as he made the announcement before anything has come out of that so now if if, if, if something, if some news were to break tomorrow, you know, that'll obviously change that. And, you know, given how quick things have moved over the last few weeks, I wouldn't be surprised if something happens before the deadline. But um, I would definitely think that the money and the his it doesn't play as much into it as the fact that he maybe didn't feel as appreciated on the PGA Tour as he probably should have been. Yeah, it's crazy. And to hear you say that he's he's the best golfer in the world right now. I mean, it just seems like we were over at Arizona State thinking, oh, this guy's really good. He maybe, you know, can join the tour and maybe win a couple tournaments. And uh, it's pretty stunning to watch his ascension here. As far as just the PGA Tour goes, how big of a blow is this for the current PGA Tour? Huge. I mean, in the last two years, they've lost two players who are ranked in the top five of the official world golf ranking, who are the former uh, British Open champion and Cam Smith, and now your reigning Masters champion, John Rahm, you know, exit. A tough blow for the tour, and it's it, it, it puts a lot of credence to something that I can't remember if it was Jimmy Dunn or Ed Hurley, he who said it during one of those uh, comical Senate hearings that they had to go up in front of, but when they said, look, if, if Liv is able to take five players a year, they could gut us, right? They could kill us. This is a start. They've taken two of the best players on the tour in the last two years. Now, granted, they need to pull more people than a Brendan Steele, a Cameron Tringale, or a 
Thomas Peters, no offense to any of them, but the guys that Liv brought in addition to Cam last year weren't going to be enough to move the needle from the tour to them. I still don't think John Rahm is a big enough name to move the needle and be able to make Liv the product that they think it wants to be, but it is one a heck of a start to be able to get him. I mean, it's it's the biggest you know, it's the biggest acquisition they've made, maybe aside from getting DJ to come first, because after DJ was the first to go, that opened the floodgates for a lot of guys. But I'd be curious to see who's going to be next after this one. Um, you know, different different reports of people's names in there. Obviously, Jason Day was one of them that a lot of us had heard, but he came out and said that wasn't going to happen. It was easy to think him, given that the, the all Aussie team, you know, has two open spots on it. So that was going to be a big name that I think could have been huge for Liv to get, but it appears he's not going. So, I mean, we'll see who else can go, but this is a, to go back to your original question, massive blow to the tour. Massive. So, so is this uh, almost a moot point if they merge? Like, how do we know anything about how the schedule will work, assuming that a deal is, is reached before the December 31st, de the December 31st deadline? Nope. <laughs> that's that's the best answer I can give you is we really don't know. I mean, I could I can speculate and guess as much as you want and I can give some thoughts. Um, you know, I think something that, that John said was interesting was he talked at, you know, the, the Ryder Cup was his biggest hurdle. Right. It wasn't the backlash that could come. It wasn't, you know, being we're working for a tour that's funded by Saudi Arabia's public investment fund. We've all talked about the sports washing and the issues that they've had. Um, but the biggest hurdle for him was the Ryder Cup. And he seems to think that you know, he's going to be able to hold on to both of his PGA Tour and DP World Tour memberships and that he still plans to, to play in the Ryder Cup in the future. And he even said, look, I hope that we can get to a point where I can play the legacy events that I've grown to love on both the DP World Tour and the PGA Tour. You know, he's been he's a multiple time winner of the Spanish Open. Spain is very important to him, his native country. I think he wants to still be involved in that if he can. So do we know what's going to happen and if they're going to be able to? No. And anybody who says they do anything is either lying or just you know, talking out their rear end, but I, it's, it's definitely going to be interesting going forward. And I think John Rahm is going to be a, a pretty important case study considering he does still have his membership on both tours. A lot of guys gave up theirs. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. He seems to think he can do it, but that's going to be something we'll have to talk about in the future. Well, and we're all concerned and wondering here if he's going to show up for the Phoenix open. There's a live event scheduled in Las Vegas, Super Bowl week, which I mean, if it's on the calendar, you would assume they would play it. Do you mm -hmm. think they play both both of those? I know I know there's no way to know, but if they reach some sort of deadline, do you think they still would go ahead and play play it as scheduled? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I, everything I've heard from Liv is where you're, they you know last year, even coming into now, we are full steam ahead, not even worried about anything. They have a full schedule for 2024, aside from a couple events that still haven't been released. Um, but and they've, they're already taking, you know, taking bids for 2025 from courses and they're getting a lot more international uh, interest than, than, you know, domestic interest in, as far as courses and people that want to host events. So they've got a, they've got a list of places that are lined up and, and, and ready to pay some big money to get them there. So, I mean, I would, I think it's crazy that they're hosting a, an, an event the same week as the Super Bowl in Vegas. I think that's just absolutely wild. More power to them. I'm excited to see how it plays out and, you know, what the interest is like for that. But I would assume, look, they're all, they're all steam ahead. Everything's going forward. I'd be shocked if they if they changed the schedule or did something different now. So do we get you out here, or are you going to the Super Bowl in Vegas? That's a great question. It's a, a good, good, question. good, yeah, a good enough. one to have, right? Good one to have. I've never <laughs> been to the I've never been to the Phoenix Open. I haven't I haven't made my pilgrimage to the People's Open just yet. Uh, one of our editors, who I know you know, is out there and tends to go to that. And we obviously have a good relationship with our you know partner paper at the uh, the AZ Republic, AZ Central there. So. Uh, they can, they tend to take up a lot of the a lot of the media seats for us there, but I'm fingers crossed they get to go at some point because it's a it's an incredible event that I'd love to see live at least once. Well, and we could drag you in here maybe for the podcast on like Friday or Saturday after a couple long nights and uh, see how way you're going. Way more so you important your than the Phoenix Open. <laughs> it's way more important than the Phoenix Open is getting to be in studio with you. Absolutely. Yeah, and we've got like Dirks Bentley here and Diplo and man, all kinds of fun. Uh, Post Malone is coming out here. I mean, Vegas doesn't have Post Malone. Like they're not they're not playing. Post Malone's not playing inside a, a coliseum on the golf course right i don't think so so yeah not, so, not, not to my knowledge yeah I, I, haven't, I haven't talked to post in a while so i'm not sure <laughs> yeah, he's the next guest here on the podcast um so <laughs> it, it do you feel like it uh, i mean as we're heading to this deadline like what has to happen what are the dominoes that have to fall and and what what are the storylines that you're kind of looking at here as far as the future like what the future of golf is going to look like yeah, I know. I mean, a lot of players still aren't happy about it. So I think that's going to be a hurdle they're going to have to get over. Um, I mean, Tiger just released a, a memo that was sent out on, you know, a week ago 
to players that was signed by all the player directors saying, look, we're actively working forward to to, to unite the game of golf and to have this be better. The, the big things to watch are, are who are going to be the people who are involved as far as funding for this for-profit entity that the framework agreement drew up, right? The, the thought is there are five other, you know, competing companies or investment funds, hedge funds that want to get involved in addition to, not just on top of, but also in addition to the public investment fund. There's thought that maybe diluting the PIFs um, investment would help get stuff passed in the government standpoint. That's all well above my pre grade, and I've tried to talk to people about it. Still confuses the ever living heck out of me trying to get that worked out and what it's going to be. But I think it's just going to be a matter of people. It's, there's going to have to be concessions made on both sides, whether it's how much money is involved, who is involved, giving said money. Um, there's so much stuff that's still up in the air, and frankly, not a lot of people are talking about it, and for good reason. There's a lot of leaks in golf, and I'm surprised not much has gotten out about this, but. Um, I think it's all just going to come down to who's going to be involved and how much money and the, the hurt getting over the players is going to be a hurdle, but also passing the DOJ's, you know, smell test is also going to be pretty tough to do, uh, depending on how much of the PIF investment is actually in there, given that it's, you know, backed by Saudi Arabia and, and, uh, Jay Monahan or Greg Norman, who has a, a more, a higher likelihood of keeping his job. Oof. Oof. You asked the tough questions. Um, Greg, see, and we, Greg kind of did a drop in on a few of us at the Live Golf Team Championship, got to talk to him for the first time, and he was confident that he's going to be around and he's not going anywhere. I mean, he's been a, a figurehead for this, um, for, for Live from the start, you know, whether we call him figurehead, punching bag, you know, wh whatever the word choice you want to use. He's been the guy out front. He's taken a lot of the shrapnel, and this is what he's always wanted, right? He's wanted a global tour dating back to the 90s when he got shut down for the first time. He's he's achieved that, and he and he deserves credit for for, for finding the people to back him and to do it with. Right, you got to give Liv at least a little bit of a, a credit, given what they've been able to do over the last couple of years to to take as many of the players and characters that they've done, and also to be able to to put together the the, the seasons that they have and the events that they have. But Jay lost so much trust with the players; he lost so much confidence in a lot of the guys. I don't know if he's done enough to get that back, but he also is going to be the as as things stand. You know, he's going to be the head guy for this new. He's going to be the CEO of this new you know for profit entity that they create, or at least that was the initial plan. So I don't know how he gets ousted. I don't know if he's going to do both jobs, whether that's be PGA tour commissioner and be the head of that for-profit entity. I'd have a hard time believing that. Um, but if I, if I honestly, if I had to say it, I think it's Greg, I think Greg has a better chance at, at, at keeping his role because he had, he doesn't have anything controversial going against him right now. And you know, Jay's got a couple hundred people who are still pretty ticked off at him, I think. Yeah. I mean, he's got the money behind him for sure. This is going to be fascinating to watch. So yeah. uh, tell us uh, what you're kind of burning on next, where your next article is going to drop on uh, golf week, what you're thinking about doing and, uh, and, and where we can follow you up until the news breaks of what the future of golf looks like. Yeah. Uh, at golf week mag and golf week, all over our social medias will be all over that at Adam Woodard on Twitter for me. What I got cooking now is just following up on what's next for Rom, right? He did talk a lot about his future and what he wants. He talked about his legacy a lot, right? And anyone who's ever listened to John Rom do an interview, there's a chance he's talked about Seve Ballesteros, right? He idolizes the guy. He talks about him all the time, holds him to an incredibly high regard. And the one thing he kept talking about tonight was legacy, legacy, legacy. He thinks that this is his way to make his mark, to be a captain, to be, as he, to quote, a pioneer for this, right? Sure, he wasn't, you know, one of the first groups of guys that came, but to come in Live Golf's third year and they don't have any plans of going away anytime soon, he thinks he's going to be around for a long time and this is his way to make his mark, similar to the way that Seve did, you know, worldwide, putting Spanish golf on the map and, you know, the, the way he was able to bring his passion to the game. And Rom thinks he can do that, but in a different way with Liv and, He's got a, a, a nine-figure deal to, uh, to help with that in case it goes south. So it's not a bad consolation prize. Yeah, we're, we're looking forward to seeing him, uh, if he's, what he's driving around the valley now and, uh, you know, if he if he moves or something like that. But he's, he's, he's always been great to us here. You've always been yeah. great to us here on uh, Arizona's Family, the Extra Point. And we need to get you out here to cover the Phoenix Open at some point. Hopefully, John Rahm and maybe even Phil Mickelson would return at some point. That would be super fun. So uh, happy okay. holidays and, uh, yeah, hope to, hope to see you soon. Yeah, appreciate you having me on. You know, appreciate the time and uh, take care. Hope to talk soon. The Extra Point Podcast is a production of 3TV, CBS5, and azfamily.com in Phoenix, Arizona.